Hey guys, welcome back to the readings of Bobcat Dog. If you're not subscribed and would like to be, you can click on subscribe and on the bell if you want to receive notifications of new videos coming out. If you want to find other videos that I've done and other readings of this book, you can click on my name or on the little picture of the dog. Uh, and you get to vote if you want me to make more of these. If you do, click on the like button. If you don't, don't click on the like button. We uh, have been talking about the bobcat, and we are just about to start talking about the bobcat dog. And if you could believe it, I have some really strong opinions about bobcat dogs. And I tried to be a little more balanced in the book than I am in real life. But even still... Um, you might disagree with me on some of my opinions and I have been learning even since I wrote this book and some of the things I believed when I wrote it I don't feel so strongly about now and some things I might feel stronger about and that's part of the great attraction to bobcat hunting is that there is always more to learn bobcat hunting is a thinking man sport and part of the point of this book is not so much to teach you how to do things but how to think about things because if you can think about things clearly you will figure it out just like a good bobcat dog they have to be able to learn to be a bobcat dog you have to be able to learn and think rightly to become a bobcat hunter successful one anyway well, let's open up this section and hopefully there'll be something in here that you can think about. What we are hunting with, the dog. Many types of dog have been used to successfully capture bobcats. Every one of the coonhound breeds and every one of the foxhound breeds has been used successfully. Purebred beagles and other rabbit-bred dogs have been used successfully where locating in a big tree is not an issue. Virtually all of the cur breeds have been used. I've heard of people catching bobcats with purebred terriers all the way from the small jag terriers on up to the Airedale. Purebred collies or herd dogs have caught bobcats as well. The spitz breeds, such as Norwegian elk hound, have caught cats. It's no secret that dogs like to chase cats. You might be surprised at the dogs that could be used. I always enjoy hearing about any dog that has been successfully used to catch bobcats. I've wondered at several dog breeds such as the Rhodesian Ridgeback originally bred as a lion dog. So many dogs and so little time to try them. This is especially true when you consider the amount of training time that goes into the making of a bobcat dog. It is hard enough to put endless training into a dog whose breeding gives you a certain sense of confidence. Putting that kind of training time into an untried breeding can be exciting, but most do not have the time, money, and energy for it. It would be tough to continue working an unknown breeding, waiting for the dog to start, in the same way we might with known bobcat dogs. The curious thing is that virtually all dogs used on bobcat were originally bred to be used on something else. We have no dog that has been bred for many centuries specifically for the bobcat. The necessary traits needed in different bobcat situations point us to unusually gifted individual dogs rather than a specific breed. The longer a strain has been used for bobcat, the higher will be our chances of finding that gifted individual dog within that strain. But some amazing bobcat dogs came from unexpected places. Every conceivable mixture of the above dogs has been used on bobcat. I have heard of many good crossbred dogs, Lab by Treeing Walker, Irish Terrier by Treeing Walker, Border Collie by Plot, Airedale by Coonhound, English Pointer 
crossed on Collie, Foxhound by Beagle, Coonhound crossed on Beagle. There are many possibilities. I was surprised to learn that one of the great South Texas bobcat hunters who caught literally thousands of bobcats in his life used beagles and beagle-mixed dogs. Some of the Mexican hunters have beagle blood in their cat dogs, but in most cases, minorities of dogs within a breed or mixture have distinguished themselves as top bobcat dogs. This is partly because so few people are in fourth-degree bobcat hunting situations. It would be rare indeed to make a fourth-degree bobcat dog outside of a fourth-degree bobcat environment, high bobcat population. But the rest of the story depends entirely on genetics. Many dogs can never become a top bobcat dog because they have not been genetically gifted for the job. With so many potential choices and so few great individual dogs, how do we proceed in our search for a good prospect? One vital consideration is that some dogs learn faster than others. In first-degree situations, the dog will not get the opportunity to be in on a couple hundred bobcat tracks before his second birthday. He might get more like half a dozen if he's lucky. Nearly every bobcat hunter I have known placed premium importance on the intelligence of a dog. If a dog is smart enough, it can overcome other deficiencies. For example, a smart dog can learn how to bark up a tree at something. It may not have a strong genetic treeing background, but it can learn. It would seem logical that we all should simply use the same dogs that the fourth degree hunters use, those hunting full time with straight bobcat dogs. But I don't think the solution is so simple. You will need to evaluate your region and your family needs. You will need to think about your reasons for hunting, your available time for hunting, and your own personal preferences in a dog. For most of us, the time we spend not hunting will be far greater than the amount of time we spend hunting. The rest of the time, you need to have a dog that you and your family enjoy being with. No matter where you end up looking for a dog, understanding certain principles may enlighten your search. Let's dive into some bobcat dog theory. Then, let's look at some necessary traits of a bobcat dog. A bobcat dog parable. This parable is simply an exercise for getting you to think of the bobcat dog as a tool. It is encouraging you to use the right tool for the job. The simple task of taking out a screw or cat can be most difficult without the right tool the right dog, for doing it. Using the wrong tool can educate the screw to the point where it is impossible to take out with a screwdriver. There. Now you don't need to read the parable. But here it is. There once was a big door constructed of wooden beams, planks, and cross members. It seemed like a passageway through the huge stone wall, but no one had been able to open it. No one knew what was on the other side, but there was great hope that getting through that doorway would provide many wonderful answers. They hoped that on the other side of the wall, the hunger would be gone. The door was held together by screws, bolts, and nails. There was a man with an amazing tool he called a claw hammer. With it, he had been able to dig around the nail heads and actually pull most of the nails out of the door. 
Now he was going after the screws with it. He could not pull them out, but he could unscrew them with the edge of the claw. He used one side of the claw to fit in the groove of any big screws near the edges of the door. If he turned everything just right, he could slowly make progress on the few of the big wood screws. A man suggested he cut one half of the two-pronged claw off, so he did. It worked a little better on the screws that way. Another man suggested he narrow the remaining claw and grind it sharper so it could fit the smaller screws, so he did. Another man suggested he cut off part of the handle so that the curved claw could actually fit into screw heads in the middle of the door. So he did. Now, with very great effort, he was making progress at unscrewing the wood screws in the door. Some of them could not be moved, though, and a couple of them he stripped out the groove in the screw head because the hammer claw did not fit them very well. When he found a couple more nails, he discovered the hammer was now almost useless for pulling nails. But at least now he was slowly getting a few of the screws out. There really was nothing at all he could do about the bolts. Another man showed up with another amazing tool. He called it a pair of pliers. Now with his pliers, this man went to work on the square-headed bolts. He could actually turn them, and they were coming loose. He started in on the round screw heads with his pliers. He had to squeeze the screw heads really hard. Some of them he could slowly turn out of the wood. Many of them he could not grip, though. They were too deeply embedded in the wood. Another man showed up with an amazing tool he called a screwdriver. With it, he began on the screws. The other two could not move. He quickly and easily began taking all the remaining screws out of the door. It seemed effortless by comparison. The only screws he could not get out were the ones that had the grooves stripped out by the sloppy claw hammer. Educated screws. In all their great effort, they had not realized something. The door had become so weakened, it was ready to fall down. Someone watching them working shouted a warning. Everyone ran back out of the way. The huge door came crashing down. They let out a huge cheer and ran through the doorway to the other side. And there they found that everything was just as it had been before. The hunger remained. And they remembered the words of King Solomon. There is nothing new under the sun. Application. Now, a story like this could have many applications. It would be more fun to let you find your own meaning for it. But since this is a book about bobcat dogs, we're working on a bobcat dog interpretation. The different tools in the story are just that. Different tools. Dogs are many things to many people. For the bobcat hunter, they are living, breathing, lovable, and faithful tools. The hammer, pliers, and screwdriver represent different types of dogs used for bobcats. The nails, screw, screws, and bolts can be seen in two equally important but different ways. Number one, the nails are coon. The bolts are bear or other non-bobcat animals. The screws are bobcats. Number two, another interpretation would be that the nails, screws, and bolts are each bobcats of different regions of North America. They might each require somewhat different tools. Either interpretation is equally important to understand. The problems in both cases are similar problems. If you do not understand these problems fully now, we hope that you will by the time you finish this book. The message we are focusing on is this. Use the right tool for the specific job at hand. In the following pages, we hope to deepen your understanding and recognition of the right tool 
for the job of capturing bobcats in your region. The overkill analysis. A few considerations with bobcat dogs are not an issue with coon dogs. One of them is the specific regional needs we find in the bobcat dogs. It seems that every region, climate zone, and topography could benefit greatly by having its own customized bobcat dog. A great coon dog is a great coon dog just about anywhere in the USA. Why the difference? A great bobcat dog in one region might not make a great bobcat dog in another region. Let's look at some possible reasons for this. One reason is a difference in bobcat subspecies. They run differently and the track ends differently. In some areas, bobcats will circle at times. In other areas, they rarely, if ever, do. In some areas, bobcats will climb trees readily and feel secure enough to stay there. In other areas, bobcats rarely climb trees, or they climb readily but never feel secure in the tree and leave it if given the chance. This can also be because of a difference in the available trees, but some areas have thousands of trees, including large conifers and bobcats there, would rather die than climb a tree. For each of these situations, different finishing skills are needed in a dog. Another reason for customized bobcat dogs is widely divergent climate. The great dogs of the south and southwest sometimes don't have enough hair to do well in the bitter cold of the north woods. A desert dog may need different tracking abilities than a snow dog or a rainforest dog. But behind these reasons is a more foundational reason. Many of our good bobcat dogs are just barely able to catch a bobcat. I'll say it again just in case you missed that. Many of our good bobcat dogs are just barely able to catch a bobcat. It would be hard to know this though since they catch them on a regular basis. That is, they catch them on a regular basis when the six factors are kept in balance. The six factors. Consider these six points toward a cohesive bobcat hunt. Number one, we find a dog that has the right combination of genetic traits for the given region and subspecies of bobcat. Number two, we give that dog the correct amount of training and opportunity. Number three, we make sure the dog is in good athletic condition, good health, and is stable emotionally. Number four, we put the dog in the right weather, scenting conditions, and topography. Number five, we put that dog with just the perfect teammate or mates. Number six, a solid relationship of trust exists between handler and dog, and the handler makes all the right handling decisions. Then, if we are lucky, we catch a certain percentage of the bobcats we put the dog on. The percentage of caught bobcats will be dictated by the variations in any of the factors, but especially in the level of giftedness of the dog and of the handler. Most good bobcat dogs are always just on the verge of not catching a bobcat. If any one or two of the six factors listed above does not line up just right, we probably won't get our bobcat. Now, if one of the factors goes off the chart in the favorable range, it might make up for a couple factors in the negative range. For example, factor number four. If we have soft snow up to the dog's chest 
and a favorable barometer and humidity, it puts factor number four off the charts in the dog's favor. It may make up for the fact that the dog is not genetically gifted enough to catch a bobcat in less favorable conditions. It may even make up for a lack of training. In fact, with factor number four, that far off the charts on the favorable side, it may just make up for negative readings on all other factors. It could be our lucky day with old slow-mo. Here's another example of the same principle. Let's say factors one and six are extremely strong. The dog is super gifted genetically. He has a good relationship with his handler who is also gifted at making all the right choices in a hunt. They might just overcome weaknesses in factors two, three, four, and five and add a teaspoon of luck and catch a bobcat. But all things being equal, we are looking for a decent score in all six factors. We are looking for predictable consistency instead of good luck. Coon Catching Overkill EF10 <laughs> Compare this with coon dogs. Many strains of coon dog require very little training except to teach them what animals not to hunt. Then just haunt them a lot. Many strains, a young dog might tree a coon his very first time to the woods. Coon dogs often tree many raccoons in one night. You can take a really good coon dog out on most any night, in any kind of weather, and in any part of the country where coon live and tree coon. For a really good coon dog, it doesn't matter if he's alone or with bad company or good company, he's still going to treat coon. One reason for this is the coon dog has a lot of overkill for the job of treeing a coon. He is way off the charts in factor one. Genetic ability for the job at hand. He can overcome extremely negative readings on some of the other factors. The poor, innocent coon dog has EF10, extreme factor one overkill. An example of a lot of overkill would be shoveling the snow off your sidewalk with a D9 bulldozer. Another example would be hauling a small tent trailer with a Peterbilt 387 semi-tractor. In either case, they could get the job done, but they have a lot more power than is needed to do the job. They have so much extra power, it might even make things look a little ridiculous. One day going south on I-39 in Illinois, I saw a great example of overkill. A flatbed truck driver had a good sense of humor. His flatbed trailer was empty except for one thing, a truck. It was a yellow dump truck he was transporting. He had huge chains holding it down. I probably would not even have given it a thought except that the truck was a Tonka toy dump truck about 8 inches tall. I got a good laugh. The driver was watching me in his mirror and he got a good laugh himself. This, my friends, is intentional overkill. I feel the same is true of coon dogs. Consider a dog we owned named Mackenzie River Banjo. He was bred from coon dogs only. Banjo had not one bear dog in his ancestry that I know of. That dog would stay out running or treeing on a bear for over 24 hours. It might be 48 hours before he would ever show up on a road. What coon hunt in the whole world would ever require that kind of stamina and desire? It is a tremendous amount of overkill. The strange thing is this. He still had that deep, deep heart of desire from his foxhound ancestors, but he no longer had the physical confirmation of the foxhound. His mind was driving his body into oblivion. 
It took days for him to recover his voice and begin to look like he was strong again. It didn't matter to him, though. Put him on another track the next day, and he would give the same heart he gave when he was fresh. Anything beyond the minimum needed. Let's consider something easily measured like size. How big does a dog need to be to be able to tree raccoon? Well, I myself have hunted with a little feist of 15 pounds that had no trouble at all treeing a coon. Fighting a 30-pound coon might have proven difficult, yet probably no more difficult than a 60-pound dog fighting a 120-pound bear. So, if 15 pounds is our minimum weight needed to tree a coon, then a 55-pound dog has 40 pounds of overkill. If we could qualify the abilities such as speed, barks per minute on the tree, stamina, drive, and so forth, some coon dogs have about 40 pounds of overkill in every single department. Confirmation lost. I feel this is why the coon hound's confirmation has become so sloppy compared to the fox hounds from which they came. They are never driven to the point of breaking down physically when their job is treeing raccoons. Therefore, physical imperfections are never noticed or corrected. I see a foxhound standing at ease on his chain and it looks like the finest coonhound that has been pinched, posed, pushed, and shaped by its nervous bench show handler. For the fox dog, physical imperfections will show up immediately when the dog breaks down and is unable to keep up day after day. So you can see a problem with overkill in the physical conformation of the coonhound. Look at the amazing conformation of some of the tiny squirrel dogs. They don't have as much overkill. Because of their small size, they must be tight built and very athletic or they will not be able to do their job. Maximum power is something that must be watched over and tested to its limits or it will diminish. Use it or lose it as the saying goes that in my opinion is one of the reasons why most coon hounds do not make top bobcat dogs balanced on the edge most decent bobcat dogs i have known have little or no overkill if they use Every resource they have to their maximum ability, they just might catch a bobcat. That is why it is hard to successfully move them to a new region or to a new handler or to put them with unfamiliar dogs. If any one of the six points described above does not line up, you suddenly go from a solid bobcat dog to a dog that cannot catch a bobcat. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm going crazy, but it's a short trip? Well, the trip from being a decent bobcat dog to a dog that cannot catch a bobcat is a very short trip. Most bobcat dogs I have known were always on the edge of not being able to do their job. I have moved some amazingly good bobcat dogs from one region to another, and they never again caught a bobcat unless taken back to their home region. I'm not talking about an adjustment period and then they did okay. I'm talking about years in their new location and they never again caught a bobcat. The six factors never again lined up for that dog in that location with that handler 
and with that dog pack. Who would have known those dogs were always on the edge of not being able to do their job? I've never seen anything like that with a good coon dog. They are never perched so dangerously close to the edge of not being able to do their job. They are miles away from it and will never fall over that edge until they just get too old to walk through the woods safely. EF1O, Extreme Factor 1 Overkill, Genetic Excess for the Job at Hand. Olympic Athletes and MMF Consider an Olympic Athlete. All Olympic athletes have the goal and dream of winning the gold medal in their event. They are sent to the Olympics because they have the potential of winning. They are sitting on the edge of making it happen. If all the factors line up for them just as the six cohesive hunt factors line up for the dog, they just might win. But they are always only one or two factors away from not winning. It is the same for the bobcat dog. Bobcat hunting with dogs, in my experience, is the Olympics of hunting with the locating tree dog. It is not a competition in the same sense, but it is very much the complete test of a dog. In serious weightlifting, the muscles are pushed to the point of failure. Some call it MMF, momentary muscle failure. There is no way to know the outer limits of strength unless pushed to the point of failure. I've done a lot of very serious coon hunting and have pushed myself to the point of exhaustion, yet I never discovered the outer limits of the coon dog's strength and ability. They were rarely, if ever, pushed to the point of physical or emotional failure. Every bobcat dog I have ever hunted has been pushed to the point of failure. Physical failure, mental failure, emotional failure. I knew exactly how strong they were. Those I experienced that came directly from coonhound stock were not strong enough in some areas. Now the whole point of pushing to MMF, momentary muscle failure, in weightlifting is to stress the muscle. Then, when it repairs itself, it is larger or stronger or has more stamina. Now, let's consider a dog that is genetically close to the edge of being able to do his job as a bobcat dog. If that dog is pushed to the point of failure enough, eventually he might be able to climb up and over that edge into the realm of doing his job. For most dogs I have seen in this category, it can take working them hard until somewhere after their second birthday. It will vary greatly according to the genetic giftedness of the dog, giftedness of his trainer, and the amount of opportunity given. Let me repeat one sentence. There is no way to know the outer limits of strength unless pushed to the point of failure. Put another way, there's no way to know a dog's weaknesses until he is pushed to the point of MMF. I'm speaking of momentary muscle failure, or momentary mental failure, or momentary motion failure, or any other point where a dog might reveal his weakness in a necessary trait. Many breeders do not know what their dog's weak spots are. I know this for a fact. We must find ways to test our dogs fully and know them fully before we breed. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious cat dog. 
Are there any bobcat dogs whose abilities could be seen as overkill for bobcat hunting? Yes, there are some. Maybe not when considered as a whole and complete package. But I know of dogs whose ability in certain areas exceed those needed to catch bobcat. One example of this is the running walker, fox, and coyote hound converted to bobcat dog. Those competition walkers can run 12 to 15 miles an hour for 8 hours a day for several days in a row. That kind of speed and stamina is overkill for any single bobcat race. It would be nice to have for the marathon weeks of hunting though. These dogs have weaknesses in other areas, yet in this trait they possess overkill. There might be dogs which taken as a complete package are overkill for bobcat. The tree and gray fox dogs of some regions may be exactly this. I do not have enough personal experience with them to make this evaluation. There may be others also. If there are, those who hunt them are not talking very loud. Well, that concludes the reading for this section. Next time, we will continue with our foxhound roots.